26th episode of the sixth season of the Ubuntu podcast. And in this episode, we're going to interview Zane Swafford about how he failed to make any money from writing software for Ubuntu. And we've also got another time saving tip, and we'll read your feedback out into our microphones. <laughs> if you're listening live or indeed watching live, you can send us messages using the chat facility on the website and in the IRC channel. I'm Tony, and joining me this evening are the devilish duo that are Mr. Mark Johnson. Hello, Tony. And Mr. Mr. Alan Pope. Hello. How are we doing, gents? All right. Yeah, not bad. Good. Not bad. Good, good, good. How are you, Mark? How, what have you been up to? Been doing anything interesting? Oh, dear. Put me on the spot there, Tony. Um, well, yeah, we I, ask every week. Yes. Uh, <laughs> I, I bought an Arduino, ah, which oh. hasn't arrived yet. It's, um, there was a, 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 I can't remember whether it was an Indiegogo or a Kickstarter for a $9 Arduino starter kit. Oh, yes. Which wow. includes an Arduino compatible board. And a whole load of electronic components and a breadboard and stuff so that um, you can sort of get started straight away without having to go down to Maplin's and buy a big bag of bits. Right. And have you got started straight away? No, because they're still making them. (laughs) But yes, it cost me $12 with with postage, which I thought was good. And they they, they were like, basically the, the chip he's using... Apparently there were there are twelve thousand on the market, and he didn't want to buy all of them and completely, um, you know, kill the supply. Yeah. So he decided he was only going to make eight thousand boards. So there was, um, and they all went in the crowdfunding campaign, and he made, right. I think, a thousand percent of his goal. That's pretty good. Yeah. Game. Ubuntu could learn a few things from that. <laughs> Just saying. <laughs> yes, yeah, uh, if Ubuntu sold Arduinos instead of phones. Yeah. Of course, tomorrow we'll find out how the uh, campaign does in its final total. Tomorrow? Yeah. Yes, because it's, oh, ne- because it's, it's next, next week, week Ah, yes, yes. Right, I see. <laughs> see what you did there, Tony. Seamless. Alan, how about you? <laughs> what have you been up to? Uh, um, I've been looking at uh, ways to secure my communication. <laughs> really? Yeah. Says the man holding an iPhone. Yes. Hey. Thanks, mate. What have you been trying? Um, I have tried... Uh, I've been using a, a tool to enable... Uh, GPG encryption of G of email in uh, webmail mm-hmm. um, because it's very easy to do with things like Mutt and Thunderbird, but um, it's a little bit more tricky in Gmail and some other webmail systems. And I wanted to be able to enable GPG uh, encryption and signing of my emails. Ah, cool. So I used something called uh, Mailvelope, right? Which um, is an extension you put in your browser, and um, it just when you're when you're typing in a in a in an email, uh, you get a little hovering button, and uh, you just if you want to encrypt the mail, you just tap that button, and it flips to a, a UI where you can put in your you know your necessary key details mm-hmm. and so on. That's pretty cool. Um, I've also been playing with uh, something called BitMessage. Uh, I had a quick look at that today. Ah, I remember uh, Admin JS, who's listening live in the IRC channel, mentioning that a little ah. earlier. So ah. he's a recommending that too. There we go. Uh, so yeah, BitMessage is kind of loosely based on um, Bitcoin, kind of um, the way, I don't know how that works. <laughs> it's like it can, it can, some computation that has to be done to prove the message before it's sent. And yeah, it's very difficult. But uh, the easier one to set up I found was one called TorChat. Right. Um, which is a little chat system that lets you send secure messages to people um, over the Tor network. And it's pretty easy. It's in the repository. App get installed, Tor chat, open it up. And you get a little chat window and then you give someone your your ID um, over some secure channel. Mm-hmm. And then from that point onwards, your your communication is you know pretty secure. It's pretty cool. Braille. Excellent. What about you, Tony? What have you been up to? Well, I've been... Um Pimping my Malawi charity fundraising. Uh, wow, have you? Yes. <laughs> on Twitter. Um, and thanks to that, I've raised 25% of my goal, just over. Oh, I wonder um, you could learn something from that. They did, yes. Um, and Maybe they should give away some Doctor Who tickets to a lucky benefactor. <laughs> yes. I ran a competition for some tickets to Doctor Who, and genuinely, <laughs> the, the random the, the random.org website picked Alan as the winner, which has saved me the price of a first-class stamp. <laughs> Seeing as he's here. No, I want you to post it to me. <laughs> I might just do that. Um, which is all well and good. So, yeah, thank you very much indeed for everybody who supported and sponsored that. Still a way to go. So, you know, keep on giving. We'll put a link in the show notes, I'm <laughs> sure. Um, but, yeah, thank you very much. Should we get on with it? Yes. <laughs> On 
the line we have Zane Swafford. Hi, Zane. How are you? Oh, I'm doing just fine here, Alan. You? Great. Uh, I'm doing very well. Uh, you've recently posted a few uh, blog posts um, after some uh, development work that you did. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the app and, and what it does? Uh, yeah, so the app's name is Spindle. Uh, it helps you track your time. Uh, if you're familiar with the application Hamster uh, for the mm-hmm. Linux desktop, it's similar to that. Um, the one thing that I tried to focus on was making the really pretty graphs and uh, you know integrating into Unity really nice. And what, what made you um, decide to create such an application? Uh, well, it was really just out of personal need. Um, I just needed a way to track my time, and I kind of got a little fed up with Hamster after realizing you had to install something separate to get it to run in the little notification center. And I just really, uh, I mean, it's a nice app, but it, uh, it didn't really fit my needs. So I went ahead and made Spindle and then decided I'd go ahead and release it. And when you released it, did you was it uh, open source, floss license, or proprietary? Uh, I, I, I'm leading up to something <laughs> here. Oh, yes, yes. Um, it's BSD license, so anyone can go see the code and do what they want with it. Um, that's just something I thought, you know, I would want from an application. Okay, but you you put it in the Ubuntu Software Center. Oh uh, yes. Tell us about that experience. Um, so all in all, it was pretty nice. Um, getting it through the review process was pretty quick, two weeks. Um, I know if I would have went to most other application stores, won't name names, but uh, the average is about a month. Um. So it was a pretty speedy process. There were a couple of people from Canonical along the way. If I would have had questions, could have asked. And, uh, but all in all, yeah, the process was pretty smooth getting it up there. And did you, was it just a case of uploading a tarball and putting some graphics in and that was about it and you were in the store? Uh, yeah, that was pretty much it. You just got to put a tarball together. The only thing that I would uh, was a little confused about is... Um, so there's not a really a proper way to test it, and I guess technically in other app stores there's really not this either, where you could test pull it down because they do remain or they do retain the right rather to uh, change it just to make it work. Uh, for example, since it does, it's just a tarball that extracts to your slash off directory. Um, they could change some things to make it work, um, but all in so all, it mean, worked out okay. You mean that you don't until it's actually live and on the store, you don't get to like do a test install of it to make sure it's doing what you think it's doing well i can do some testing but um if they would change anything yeah i'm not sure how i would know or test oh, against that oh, so there, there isn't there isn't like a a um a bit a build put up before it goes live in the store that you can then download and verify yeah there's not really a process for that but um i guess in comparison to the alternative the alternative being something similar to what you might see in the uh Mac or iOS app store would be, uh, they just reject it. <laughs> um, it's a little more polite. <laughs> right. So, and what did you set the, um, the price point for the app and, uh, how long was it in there? And did you generate any sales and are you now a millionaire? Uh, well, I'll start with the last one. No, <laughs> um, <laughs> just cause that's the quickest. Um, <laughs> but it's two ninety nine. It's their minimum price. Well, two dollars and ninety nine cents American. Right. Um, I'm not sure what that is in pounds. Is that is that a price that you you were thinking of, or is that you know uh, just the minimum and that's what you wanted to put it at? Well, honestly, I was thinking about five dollars, but then I I just looked into it, did some testing, and I found that uh, apparently that's just uh, unreasonable to charge the same amount as you would for a cup of coffee for software. <laughs> right. Um, yeah. yeah. Some, so um, I just went ahead and said, fine, the $2.99, uh, the minimum, which I will point out, I'm really glad that's the minimum. Um, Why, what makes it, you say that? Well, I think if you just, well, I personally kind of think that the whole idea of pushing everyone to make a 99 cent app has just kind of commoditized software as a whole. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's nice that people can afford you know, to buy 50 applications for their smartphone to carry in their pocket. But the quality of those applications might come into question, I think. Um, I mean, the idea of, I mean, just try to remember probably 2005, 2006, before we really had any major 
app center, not just on Ubuntu, but in general. Right. Um, it wasn't uncommon to see software for fifty dollars, something like that. And uh, yeah. now, if you try to charge something for like, you know, that's that's preposterous. I don't know how you would ever get away with that. <laughs> it's interesting because I've seen a counter argument that uh, that two ninety nine is is too high. That um, people want to be able to sell very small utility apps, like for example, you know, the Minecraft launcher, or you know, something really lightweight that probably took the developer no more than a day or two to create, and they want to sell it at a really low price point, and the two ninety nine is is too high for that. Mm. Uh, it's interesting to hear the counter counterpoint that it's it's too high for your kind of application. Well, essentially, like the Minecraft launcher is a really good example. Um, if that developer which I think I actually had asked him a couple questions. I'm not sure. Um, there was a couple Minecraft launcher apps on there. Um, if they felt that it was probably worth less than two ninety nine, my personal opinion is that you should just release it as free. Um, if I think that's just a fair minimum point. I mean, if you're going to invest even a day's work into it, you should think about getting a little something back out of it because I don't think... At least for myself and the statistics I've seen for other people, I don't think 99 cents is even logical on the Ubuntu Software Center. So yeah. having had your application approved for 2.99 into the Ubuntu Software Center, uh, this is the bit where you just sit back and count the money as it comes in? Not exactly. Um, <laughs> okay, what happened? How did it go? Um, well, I put it up there and... I had initially set out a goal to just see if I get $100. That was my initial investment between AdWords and paying a designer to do the pretty icon. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't quite make that in the first 30 days of having it up there, which I could accept. Um, but essentially, as soon as I launched it, for at least the first week, I tried to push it as much as I could without becoming a used car salesman. <laughs> um, used software salesman. <laughs> <laughs> Bye now, Windows 3.1. <laughs> At least you're not going for 32 million. Yeah. Uh, oh, dear. Don't start down that road. <laughs> okay. Yeah. No, that's all right. Uncle Mark will write the check, right? <laughs> so anyway, uh, back no. to your story. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, I didn't make that, but I personally think it's just because I did run out of time to keep promoting it. But outside of that, I have been taking some support questions. Um, since my project's up on GitHub, mm. people have been making feature requests, which I'm really a fan of. I really like the idea of other people giving me feedback and getting their opinions in there uh, for version two. Mm -hmm. So given that you're, given that the software is BSD licensed and on GitHub as well as being for sale in the software center, did you find that there was an increase in people downloading it like outside of the software center while it was on sale instead of buying it? Um, I actually can't track as far as I know if that happens, and I really wouldn't care if it did. Hmm. Um, essentially, one reason, pretty much the main reason why I charged money, I'm not really hoping to pay my rent with this money, yeah. um, but I'm hoping that it adds value to the software. Um, I know that's kind of a corny thing to say, but if you pay for something, you do have to make a, a little bit of a physical investment, yeah. and if you're willing to put in enough time to download the tarball from GitHub, extract it to your slash opt, um, chmod the binary, and do everything you need to do to get it up and running, then I'd say you've made the time investment. And as far as I'm concerned, you've earned it. Go ahead, take it. Mm. Um, mm. I'm, of course, I'd be happy if you bought it. Um, but either way, I just... The biggest problem, and I know that this is not a very popular opinion, but uh, free users are not the best users. What makes you say that? Yeah, so essentially, one thing that I've kind of noticed, and you know, I've been a victim of this myself, is that uh, if there's a lot of free apps or something like that, uh, for example, take the Android app store. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I'll just download apps, look at it for five seconds, and then I'll probably uninstall it by the end of the day. That software really holds no meaning with me. Um, versus what I want to do is hopefully have something that someone either puts money or time into getting, and the software means something. It's not just disposable, you know. So um, you're engaged users, yeah, rather than yes. just customers. Um, and 
essentially, I'd like to get feedback, but I know, at least from what I've observed, that users, especially free users, um, will give reviews such as, doesn't work, <laughs> zero out of one. <laughs> or zero out of five stars. Yeah, and it's like okay, that's that's very helpful. Thank you. <laughs> um, <laughs> but especially what I've started noticing is I've had a lot of users, which I think it's awesome that people actually go to the GitHub page, uh, leave feedback if something wouldn't work. For example, I did uh, correspond via email with someone who was having an issue. Uh, they were willing to show me the terminal output of it, mm-hmm. or they wanted a feature. And they were willing to describe it in detail, how they would like it. Um, and that's the kind of interactions I'd like to have. Um, essentially, I'm writing software for a niche community. Yeah. Um, so I'd really, you know, why not just go all in on that? Make niche software, be happy with it. So do you also find it, um, as, well as, as well as affecting the motivation of your users, do you find it affects your motivation as a developer working on the software if there's money associated with it um very much so yeah um the money not so much just because i don't really i don't really look at it too much really um but having the users there kind of mentally forces me to do something about it um if i would have released this app for free right now it's kind of a busy time for me and i probably would have just you know said forget it Mm -hmm. and I'd probably never touch Spindle again. Right. Um, but since I do have that commu- – I don't want to say that I'm like huge or anything. I don't have like some <laughs> amazing community, but I have a couple people that I correspond with over it. Yeah. And I feel like I owe it to them to continue to make this and try to make it better and make something better for them and hopefully bring in more people. What lessons have you learned from the whole project? Um, what What do you think – that you could pass on to other developers? What do you think uh, is useful information specifically around about developing paid apps for Ubuntu? Yeah. Um, essentially, don't try to make it up on... <laughs> essentially, don't. <laughs> Excellent. No, no uh, don't try to make it up on volume. Right, um, okay. Just acknowledge that you're developing niche software and there are going to be a lot of people who expect free applications. That's mm-hmm. just the world we've kind of come on um not really any one developer's fault maybe just the ecosystem as a whole you know apps becoming 99 cents are free but you know just acknowledge that software is your time and you deserve just a little bit of kickback from that and that yeah don't don't worry about making it up on sales just worry about uh maybe getting a little bit of a price point but definitely don't try to pay your rent with the uh software center is there anything which um you think that canonical and the ubuntu project could do to uh to make the the paid apps ecosystem better they could rebuild the software center what you mean as the application for yes for buying apps yes that, that would if i um if i got appointed by mark today <laughs> and he's just like okay go fix this um that would be the first thing i would do is because i don't know I don't know many other people's opinion on it, but I know personally that I find it pretty much awful to buy anything from, and half the time it does not work from that application. Mm-hmm. So is that the, the, the buying process, the searching for applications process, or just the whole thing? Whole thing, whole thing entirely. Um, searching for applications is slow. Launching the software center is slow. Putting in your credit card info is something you have to do almost every time. Um, and... I'm sure there are a lot of people who work very hard on it, and I don't want to put any disrespect towards them. Sure. But the application as itself is, well, there's no need to lie about it. It's terrible. <laughs> no, that's interesting feedback. That's exactly why we got you on. Um, I agree that it's very slow, certainly. I've never tried to buy anything through it, so I can't speak to the rest of the experience, but it is very slow. Uh, and I, I personally feel like it should be no harder than it is to buy something from Amazon or um, the iTunes app store. And I don't know if you've used either of those services, but, uh, it's almost easier, easier to accidentally buy something than it is to. <laughs> oh, totally. Yeah. Um, I've done that. <laughs> which I mean, I don't want that to happen to people cause that's not fair, but, um, I, I'd like it to be a little easier process. And mm-hmm. then on top of that, I think they should another unpopular opinion. I know I'm just kind of full of those. Um, Go for it. I think they should be a little more restrictive of what they get in there. Right. What the selling you mean? What well, should be curated? Um, 
well, essentially, ideally, um, they should, you know, have design standards, you know, speed response standards say, For okay, this application, apps. yeah, this application crashes or this application looks like it was written with Java Swing. <laughs> Why did you do that? No, I mean, I know there are a lot of people who make a lot of great Java applications, but, you know, and I, I think now that they're picking the uh, QT, QML, QT Quick uh, base, mm -hmm. that if they would just say, okay, from this point on, if your application is paid and it's not made with this, we're not approving it. That would be so unpopular, but that would be definitely what they need. Mm. Yeah. No, it's, an not a, it's certainly an interesting point of view. I, 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 I can see how someone coming from another platform where there is a store that is curated would come to this and think it is very much like the Wild West. <laughs> well, I mean, I'm not really coming from another platform. I've been using Ubuntu um, for most of the time that I've been using a computer. Uh, it's just I've kind of seen what other people are doing, and I, I think, you know, I mean, we have the Wild West of Android, which is slowly becoming a little more cleaned up. Mm -hmm. And then we have the other extreme, you know, the North Korea of Apple. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody gets out of this little life tonight, do they? <laughs> yeah. No. Um, and, you know, neither one is the right answer, but maybe somewhere in the middle would be nice. <laughs> Sounds fair. Yeah. Well, I mean, I... I would like to say we're fixing all of this with uh, Ubuntu Touch, but um, we'll wait and see. <laughs> um, thank you, Zane, so much for coming on. If, uh, if people want to read more of your, your writings, uh, where can they go? Uh, you can just go to my blog at zaneswafford.com. Magic. Thanks very much for coming on, Zane. Yeah, no problem at all, Alan. Cheers. Cheers, Zane. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Command line love. Nice. Excellent. <laughs> <laughs> Disturbing. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the command line love time saving tip of the week is Up Records, which is part of the Uptime D package. Yeah. It doesn't really save you any time. Um, well, what does it do? It tells you about oh. time. Ah. Yes. It, um, it, I like this. Uh, it, uh, it's not really super useful, but. <laughs> Um, as someone who likes stats and graphs and stuff, right. it's good. So you install Uptime D. Yes. And then once you've installed Uptime D, it keeps track of your system uptime. Um, that and, sounds valuable. And every time you run the command up records, yes. it reports the last, uh, the top 10 uptimes you've ever had since you installed Uptime D. Okay. Um, and then your percentage uptime, number, amount of time your system's been up, amount of time your system's been down. So it's actually quite a nice mm. little reporting tool if you put it on servers, for example. Uh, yes, okay. Um, to report your, your uptime. So, you know, um, but the other, the other nice thing about the, uh, the, um, the top 10 list is it prints the kernel release next to each one, the kernel you were running when you had your highest uptime. So, you know, you can boast about, you know, when I was on kernel 2.6, whatever, right. I had an uptime of 500 days or something like that. Right. Right. Or you can prove that you only you only reboot when the kernel changes or something. Yeah, partly. Um, so I I, uh, I ran this on, I installed this on my VPS, I think, uh, back in 2007, and I've been running it ever since. Okay. And so I think there's a little bug in it because it says... Um, that it's been up for 2,844 days. Right. Um, it's been down for 540 days. No, down for minus 540 <laughs> days. <laughs> and my percentage uptime is 123%. <laughs> and which you I think, think there might be a bug. I, yeah, I, I've yet to report that yet. But I think it's pretty spectacular right. uptime. Well, Thank it, you, Bitfolk. Yeah. <laughs> Well, it does save you a lot of time, Alan, and I'll tell you how. Because if you wanted to know the last 10 uptimes of your system, it saves you all the time you would spend grepping your logs for boot messages, trying to work out when they were, um, when they were last modified and stuff, mm. or, or writing your own system to tell you this information, which would take up a lot of time. Nicely, so, nicely dug there, yeah. Tony. Thank you very much. Good. Yes. Call on me. Um, that's the end of the command line love. <laughs> Uh, 
our inbox is bulging with your feedback. So we're going to start working your way, our way through some of it right now. And the first one is from Anirban Chatterjee, who's emailed us from Calcutta, which is Calcutta uh, in India, to say... Not many people here are actually into podcasts, usually preferring the radio, but I've convinced a few of my fellow countrymen to listen to the Ubuntu UK podcast. The penetration of Linux here in India is rather shallow. The government has devised BOSS, Bharat Operating System Solutions, a custom Debian-based distro with versatile support for most Indian languages. That alone is perhaps the biggest reason for which Ubuntu and other distros are finally making their way into rural India, although English-educated urban guys are still reluctant to leave their beloved Windows 7 systems. Indian language computing is a big deal for thousands of programmers and users in rural India. The digital e-courts project initiated by the Indian judiciary has finally decided to switch to the customised versions of Ubuntu from the previously used Rail distros. Ooh. Yes. Uh, we're trying to popularise Ubuntu here, although I must say people seem to prefer Metro to Unity. What? <laughs> and Gnome 3 simply scares them. Uh, but I hope this will improve with time. Already there are tiny but thriving locos around here, especially centred around metropolitan cities such as Mumbai, Calcutta and Delhi. And especially in the south, there are many who are ready to die for Ubuntu. I wouldn't go that far. Crikey. Yes. (laughs) I like it, I know, but yes. Thanks very much for that. That's That's very interesting. It's it's good to hear about... uh, the success we're having in various parts of the world. Yeah, and good luck with those locos. Um, and if you're involved in any of those locos, send us an email. Um, mm. Perhaps we can read out uh, your emails as well. Mm. Um, so Derek Theophile has emailed in with the partitioning problem. I blew away my Windows partition, which I hardly used anyway, and have gone Linux Mint 15 Cinnamon all the way. The problem uh, yay, is sort of. <laughs> the problem is that a window pops up saying the root file system has only twenty four point one megabytes disk space remaining. I can't see why my root, my why my file system is full. I don't save anything to root. It's all saved on my home partition. Hmm. Ask Tony. <laughs> Well, whilst we can't help with the detail of, of the technical problem here, and it's probably best pasted to somewhere like Ask Ubuntu or the Ubuntu forums. Or to get perhaps some... the Linux Mint forums in this case. Yeah, sorry. The Linux... <laughs> <laughs> Burn. Is there Ask Mint? <laughs> Is that a thing? I don't... Does it exist? They, um, have, they, ha- they have their own support infrastructure, I'm sure. Yeah, so firstly, go and use that. Uh, no, but secondly... Um, there are some good applications out there that can show you what is using oh, yes. up your disk space. Um, there's one that's bundled with Ubuntu and hopefully therefore available on Mint as well, mm-hmm. which I think is called Disk Usage Map. Analyzer. Disk Usage Analyzer, is it? Yeah, the, the package name is Baobab. Yes. It's <laughs> B-A-O-B-A-B. B-A-O-B-A-B. Yes. It's the name of a tree. And that shows you a big sort of weird graphy thing that, yes. that indicates where your files are and where the big ones are and which ones you can perhaps delete to create some space easily. Yes, I use that all the time, actually. Mm, it's, yeah. it's really useful because I've got an SSD in my laptop, so I'm, I'm forever running low on space. It's not a very big one. And um, I run Baobab or disk usage, whatever it's called, in, the, in the menu. Yeah. <laughs> Um, but I like saying Baobab. So There's I an equivalent it. one called File Light as well for KDE, which does a good job of that. Yeah, it used to be built into Conqueror as well, just yes. along with everything else. <laughs> so basically, our advice, if I'm reading it correctly, is randomly delete things from your root partition. <laughs> do not do that. Space. <laughs> it's yeah, that's not our advice. Excellent. Nathan emailed to ask which version of your podcast is better quality, OG or MP3? Yes, neither. <laughs> is the answer <laughs> technically the mp3 is a higher bit rate than the og version um but actually we kind of encode them so they sound the same mm, the og yeah. files tend to be smaller but they're slightly better og can quality. give you better quality at a lower bit rate so Indeed. that's why that's the case that's why og is good yes well it's one of the many reasons why og is good absolutely but yeah which, whichever one you think sounds best that's the best one yes and and whichever one plays on the device you want oh, yeah. to play it on. And whichever one respects your freedom. Oh, <laughs> Andreas Abendroth emailed from Sorry. Chemnitz, Germany. Chemnitz? I don't know. I'm not German. I'm sorry. In recent episodes, you discussed the difficulties in giving precise specifications of the time you record the podcast live. Such things as UTC and GMT. Why don't you use the Julian Day? Great idea. Not to be confused with the Julian calendar. Oh. <laughs> it specifies a precise and unique specification of time and nobody can be fused, confused with summer or winter time. I enjoy your show and it helped and helps me to improve my skills in understanding spoken English. Oh dear. <laughs> Very sorry it about does, that. It does, yeah, it does worry me that someone might be learning English from us. Indeed. 
Um, but that's an interesting suggestion. Maybe we'll have to go away and look up what Julian it's, days it's are. It's basically days counted from um, a particular day in like 4000 BC. It's like Unix oh. time, but for days. Right. So it counts from when the world was created, right? Yes, I think that's right. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, if you believe those books, okay. And we'll get emails about that. Um, thank you very much indeed for all of your feedback. The Ubuntu Podcast needs you. Yes, you. If you hear something that entertains, engages, or enrages you, tweet at UUPC or email podcast at ubuntu-uk.org. You can also talk to us on the telephone, Skype, Facebook, and Google+. Plus. Find links to all these places on our website, podcast.ubuntu-uk.org. Please do get in touch. I mean it. Just one message. Just to know there's someone out there who cares. Admin JS in IRC, who's listening live, has just told me it's pronounced Chemnitz. Ah, thank you, Admin JS, and your extensive knowledge of German geography. Um, but that is all for this episode. So join us on Wednesday, the 28th of August. That's Julian Day number 2,456,533 <laughs> at 1930 UTC for our next live episode. That's half past eight in the evening for those listening in the UK. And Are we going to do this yeah. video thing again? We'll see what the feedback is, but I think it's gone okay. Mark ate some cake on camera and got it in his beard. But apart from that, <laughs> it all went very well. Um, but thanks for listening and thanks for watching. See Cheers. you next time. Bye bye. Bye bye.